Book of Ezra, chapter 1, verse 5 through 11. We'll be opening up with that this morning, and we'll be going through this, this morning's teaching. Amen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before your throne this day, Father God. Just thanking you, Lord Jesus, for another beautiful day, another wonderful morning, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for another breath of life this morning, Lord Jesus. And thank you, Father God, that, Lord, that's what we're here to do, Lord. We're here to celebrate the life that we have in you, Lord Jesus. Father God, thankful, Lord, that every morning, my God, and every day, my God. We get to celebrate, Lord Father, the life that we have in you, Lord Jesus, the life that you have freely given us, Father God. And that life, Father God, is everlasting, Lord, is eternal, my God. Father, and we just thank you this morning, Father God, because, Lord, we realize, Father God, that, Lord, our time in this world, my God, is nothing compared to the life of eternity with you, my God. But, Father, we thank you this morning as we're able to come together, Father God. And, Lord Jesus, we're able to worship you and glorify you and praise you and bless your holy name, Father God, for you are worthy of all praise, my God. And Father God, as you are teaching us, Father God, to walk and to live, Father God, in that eternal walk, my God. Father Lord, recognizing and realizing, my God, that Father Lord, we can serve you now. We can bless you now. We can glorify you now, my God. So Father, this morning we come before your throne, Lord, and thanking you, Lord. Thanking you, Father God, for all that you have done for us, Lord. Thank you for the salvation that we have in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, this morning. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for your love, my God. Thank you for your mercies and your grace this morning, God. Thank you for your peace and your joy, Lord God. Thank you for, Father God, Lord Jesus, the work that you begin in us, we will see it to completion until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, my God, that lives in us, my God. Thank you this morning that we together collectively are the temple of the living God. Thank you, Lord, that you are the head, Lord. Thank you that you are a good shepherd, my God. Thank you, Father God, as we are here this morning, Father God, to, Lord, to just come humbly before your throne, submitting ourselves unto you, Lord God, and, Lord, resisting the devil as your word says he will flee from us, Father God. Lord, we thank you this morning as you are Lord of lords and you are King of kings. You are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You are the resurrection and you are the life, my God. And Lord Jesus, you are Lord of all, my God. So Father, we just thank you this morning. We ask you to forgive us of our sins, to forgive us of all unrighteousness and uncleanliness, Father God. Father, you know our hearts. You know, Father God, Lord Father, everything that goes on within our minds, Father God. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you, Lord, if we have allowed any life other than, Lord, your life, Father God, to come to life within our hearts and within our minds, Father God. Father, we ask you for your forgiveness of our sins this morning, Lord. We repent of all unrighteousness and uncleanliness, Father God. And Father, we ask you this morning to forgive us of our own self-righteousness, Father God, our own good merits, Father God, because we recognize, Lord, that even in that we fall short, my God. Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Forgive us, Lord God, if we have, Father, allowed the ways of the world to compromise, Father, our walk in you, Lord. Forgive us, Lord God, if we have compromised the ways of the flesh, my God, in bringing that flesh into your holiness, my Father God. Father, forgive us of our sins this morning. And if any way we have offended anyone else, Father God, Lord, we ask you to forgive us this morning. And Father, Lord, in every area and way that we have offended you, my God, forgive us this morning, my God. And Father, with that same forgiveness by faith that we receive this morning, Father, help us to forgive, Lord Jesus, as we ourselves have been forgiven, my God. Lord, recognize my God, that, Lord, we are not to walk with bitterness or unforgiveness, Lord, but to walk in the freedom of your forgiveness and your mercies, Lord. Father, therefore, my God, with the same mercy we ourselves receive, Father, we can give that same mercy to someone else, my God. Someone else that, Father, maybe does not deserve it, my God, as we did not deserve it. But, Lord, we give it because we ourselves have received it, my God. And recognizing, Lord God, that we have all that we need in you, Lord Jesus. 
Jesus. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. We come together, Lord God, looking to you, Lord, the author and the finisher of our faith. We ask you this morning that your will be done. We're here to seek you, Lord God, to seek your word and to seek your presence, to seek Father God, Lord Jesus, what your perfect will is, my God. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we lay every hindrance aside, my God, every sin that so easily entangles us, Father. We lay those things aside this morning. Every distraction, Father God, everything that is going on in this world, my God. Lord, you are in control and know it all, my God. So, Father, this morning we come together trusting you, believing you, Lord, and knowing, my God, that you, Father God, are faithful, my Lord. So, Father, this morning we thank you, Lord. Father God, we thank you that you did not give us a spirit of fear, timidity, but a power of love and of a sound mind and discipline, Lord. We thank you this morning, Father God, for this time, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So we're in the book of Ezra, chapter 1, and we'll be reading verse 5 through 11. So I'll open us up this morning. It says, Then rose up the heads of the fathers, houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, every one whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus king of Persia brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shezbazar, the prince of Judah. And this was a number of them, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and a thousand other vessels. Vessels. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. So this is a portion of scripture that we'll be looking at this morning. And the topic that I placed here to this morning that we will be praying according will be, we will be praying for the church to return to a heart of worship and giving and laboring for his will to be done. So I'll read that one more time. We're praying this morning for the church to return to a heart of worship and giving and laboring for His will to be done. So in order for all this work to be done, there, must, there would have to be provision and there would have to be laborers that were willing to go back. And so a couple of footnotes here that are read. If we notice here in verse 5, it says that only those from the houses of Judah and Benjamin. So imagine out of the 12 tribes of Israel, the people here in Persia at this time, only two tribes returned back. And that was from Judah and, uh, and Benjamin. And it says here that... In this time that the other ten tribes, because they were taken by Assyria, which were, tra you know, they were captive by Assyria, that they were so utterly destroyed and so utterly scattered that they must have come to a point in time that maybe they didn't even realize that, was this really even their heritage? Was this even really their people? Were they really obligated to go back because they weren't even sure if I'm even from that tribe or where I'm even from anymore? They had lost their way and they had lost who they were as a people. So it's thought, and the thought is, is that many, because of that, felt, well, then I'm not really obligated to have to go back and rebuild this. But Judah and Benjamin did. And thank God they did. They were unwilling to share in the vision of rebuilding the temple. So there was a vision given, this is what we're going to do, this is what God wants us to do. But because they weren't sure, and there was just so much confusion at that time, that it just felt, well, no, I'm not catching that vision, so therefore, we're not following. But what I love about this, it says here, And the priest and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go to, up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. So... How many of us know, though, it has to be God that stirs up His people, that God knows there's a reason and a purpose for everything. We're not here to point fingers at those that didn't go back. It is what it is. That's life. 
But what I love about it is that God did stir up the heart of those from Judah and Benjamin, the Levites, the priests, to go back in the rebuilding because they were able to see the vision that there would be a restoration of the temple. This, is, this could be possible. The very presence of God, everything that we, that we were as a people could be restored. But it wasn't in their own. It was by the Spirit of God that God drew them to this work. I read this here in verse 5 through 6. It was a good footnote. It says, The journey would be difficult. It would be dangerous. It would be expensive. And it would last for over four months. So definitely it was going to take up their time. The conditions were poor. This was a desolate land. This land was in ruins. It was destroyed. So they're not going back to a nice land that's, no, they have to go, it's a cleanup. It's a place that has been utterly destroyed. And not only that, it was a hostile environment. Because Israel had many enemies. Jerusalem had many enemies. And they were happy when they were destroyed. They were happy to see the children of God, the people of God, destroyed. This is what they had waited for. Because they feared Israel. They feared Jerusalem. They feared this nation for so many years. So there had been no rebuilding. It was still utterly wasted. And not only that, according to Persian records, in this time, there were many Jews that had accumulated great wealth. They had become rich in the land. And the Bible in Jeremiah said, Build houses. Buy lands. Pray for the peace of that land so that my peace will be in there because it's not only upon you, but it's also upon all those around you. So they took this to heart. And they rebuilt and they grew wealth. They became established, which wasn't a bad thing. The problem was, is they became too comfortable when the work of God and the will of God and the timing of God was calling His people back. To do this would mean that they would have to start over. And they may have had to have given everything up. So imagine, they already have an established in Persia. So in order to go back to Jerusalem, this could cost them everything. They would have to give up their land. They would have to give up and, and give their wealth. And they would have to start over in the land they weren't even sure was going to really be built back up. The Word of God said it, but they didn't fully understand it. So many chose the comforts they were not willing to sacrifice. What they had become so accustomed to knowing. It's not a bad place, but it's a dangerous place. Because I don't believe that it was just in their wealth that they had compromised. But they had also become part of the gods and everything else that was part of Persia at that time. And I placed here, are we as a church ready and willing to be that sacrifice for His glory and for His truth to be revealed? Are we willing to choose comfort over what God wants and what His will is today? Because that is a real place. It's not an easy place to have the comforts of the world. There's nothing wrong with having the comforts of the world, only when it comes to a place where it comes greater than God. We read about the rich man, who the Lord says, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And it says he was downcast because he had such great wealth. And he walked away. And that was one of the ones that Jesus called, said, come and follow me. Many times I wondered, wow, Lord, could it have been that you would have given him everything back? All you, look, all you were looking for was the heart. Because he named all the other commandments that had to do with people. But he forgot the other commandments that had to do with God. It was a heart unto God. Giving is not... Because God needs it, we know that. The Bible says He owns a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. God is, owns everything. 
He does it because it's a heart of worship unto Him. Not just with our words, not just with our lives, but in everything that has to do with our lives, our heart. And our finances, our resources are part of our worship unto God. We do it because we love Him. We do it because we recognize, Lord, it's all yours anyways. But in that, we become so free. Because never will our, our jars run out. Will our well run dry. Because the Lord always, if it's His, then He has every resource. He's not, we have a storehouse in heaven. But what it has to do, it has to do with the heart. But what I love about this is that the ones that God did call back, God was stirring up the hearts of the people by His Spirit. By His Spirit. So in verse 8, 6 it says, And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. So not only was there a bunch of things freely offered, but there was all these other things that were given to them for the journey. Everything that they would need, the provisions, because they were willing to say, Yes, I see the vision. I believe what God wants to do. I believe that the Lord wants to rebuild this temple, His presence. That Jerusalem can be that place again where people could come to know God. Because that's what it was all about. The temple was there so people could come to know the one and only true living God. A compassionate God, a loving God. Yes, a fearful God, but a God who made a way through then was a sacrifice and today is by the blood of Jesus. Verse 7 says, Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Wow. When Nebuchadnezzar went into that temple, he destroyed everything. He burned a lot of it, but a lot of the gold and a lot of the silverware, a lot of that stuff that looked very costly, he brought that back. But see, God was keeping His promise by restoring everything that was taken. Because all that stuff didn't belong to the people. It belonged to Him. The silverware and all that was there was all dedicated and sanctified unto the Lord for His purpose. And therefore, the Lord placed it upon Cyrus's heart to give him all these things to take back to the temple. What a, what a prayer, what a faith. Giving unto the vision. The temple's not even rebuilt yet, and they're taking all these things back for a temple that hasn't even been rebuilt yet. But this is all God stirring up the people's heart by His Spirit to give them that vision that this would be done. And they were giving by faith that this would be done. God was keeping His promise and made provision and more than enough for the work from all the walks of life. Not only from the Jews, but also from others. Not only that was the Lord restoring what was taken from the temple, this is our prayer this morning. Lord, we ask that you would stir up your people by your spirit to, to return back with a heart of worship, no matter the cost. Realizing we all have need. We have all that we need in Christ Jesus. It says in verse 8, Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah, and this was the number of them. 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. And that name Sheshbazar there is, some believe it may have been Zerubbabel, and this was just his name that was changed, just like Daniel and, and the other three that were there, their names were changed. But imagine this. It was God who stirred up the hearts of the people to give unto the work of the Lord. Not just their time, but their finances, what they had, what they were able. And not only that, the Lord restored what was rightfully His. 
How many of us know today that we as a church need to be restored back to a heart of worship? And a lot of that has to do with our giving, with our finances, with our resources of what we have today. But it has nothing to do with because God needs it. It all has to do with the heart because we love God and we're so grateful to be a part of the work that He is doing and that He is building up. Because the Lord is doing a work and He is doing a building up. So our prayer this morning is, is that we would return back to a heart of worship. Because this is an area that the church struggles with many days, many today. With giving unto the Lord. But I believe this is an area that we as a church need to return back to. Not out of compulsion, not because we're being forced to, not because we're being given an ultimatum, not because, well, if you give this, then this is what's going to happen. No, but because we recognize, Lord, it all belongs to you anyway. And Lord, if it be your will, Lord God, then Father, in every area that I can give, Lord, I'm going to give wholeheartedly unto you with a cheerful heart. Because I recognize it's all yours anyways, Lord, for your will to be done. So that is our prayer this morning. That is our prayer this morning.